Support for this episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. And also by the generous support of listeners like you, who choose to support us at Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. Patreon.com slash trifles. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the cyclist was solitary, the bachelor was noble, and the resident was patient, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? On which three continents did Watson have experience of women? When did 221B Baker Street first get telephone service? And why does Holmes prefer telegrams over writing? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 319, Compound Surnames. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And actually, I should say I'm William Scott Monty for the sake <laughs> of this episode. How's that? Well, that's okay, but I'm Burton Ragland Wolder, and that, I think, beats Scott Monty. William. It certainly does. You don't seem Ragland at all. Uh, well, you have to look at the cuffs of my trousers. That's where all the <laughs> ragged ends are. <laughs> Well, uh, this should be an interesting episode. It was actually born out of an email from uh, Gus Hulwerda from the Jeremy Brett Sherlock Holmes podcast. And seeing as the stories were written by Arthur Conan Doyle, um, (laughs) this should make for an interesting topic because there are a number of three-named people in the canon. And it's not necessarily clear that all of them are compound surnames. So we're going to talk about the uh, process uh, by which uh, these names perhaps were selected. Uh, We'll look at some of the old scholarship behind it and look at the convention of the time. Uh, Was this a normal thing in Victorian England and how it carries through today? So it should be an interesting discussion if you'd like the show notes for this episode and we will have links to some of the sources we're talking about you can find them at ihose.co slash trifles 319 that uh, url is displayed in your podcatcher in the show notes here um, but it'll also take you directly to the sherlock holmes podcast.com website the trifles homepage right there to this specific episode so check that out check those links out and also make sure you're signed up as a patreon supporter we do have uh, benefits for our patreon supporters including ad-free versions of these episodes and thank you gifts at certain tiers and of course every single patreon supporter is eligible for our monthly drawing for a free back issue of the baker street journal and a quarterly drawing for a free annual subscription to the Baker Street Journal. So check that out. For as little as a dollar a month, you can support us here at Trifles. So compound surnames. You know, this isn't something that uh, I gave terribly much thought, if any, to until I uh, received this email from... Uh, Gus, as I mentioned, he specifically was referring to uh, Wisteria Lodge. You remember Wisteria Lodge, Bert? I do, I do. Boy, I had a great burger there once. <laughs> the Lodge Burger. It's uh, well, it's actually it's all, it's all chicken when you think about it. Um, <laughs> Good. And for those of you who don't understand that joke, go read Wisteria Lodge. That'll that'll help you out. Um. But Gus asked about John Scott Eccles. The telegram, of course, arrived at Baker Street, 
and it was signed Scott Eccles. And Watson, of course, questioned whether the telegram was from a man or a woman, and Holmes required, well, a man. No woman would have sent a reply-paid telegram. So uh, the question that Gus had was, was this uh, Scott Eccles? Was that a compound surname? Was that his uh, <laughs> last name, like Conan Doyle? Or was it simply his first name, Scott, or in this case his middle name, because it was John Scott Eccles? And so the question is, was it John Scott Eccles? Or was it John Scott Eccles? <laughs> so, and look, I've been struggling with this kind of thing my entire life because, as you know, my name is Scott Monty. But as I said in the intro there, it's actually William Scott Monty. Mm. I don't go by the William. Uh, I, I used to just sign everything W. Scott Monty. And let me tell you, when you get into things like government IDs and frequent flyer programs, it gets really complicated because everyone wants first name, middle initial. That's the way the world works. And when you go by first initial, middle name, it complicates matters. So, you know, I've, I've been having to deal with putting W. Scott as my first name with no middle initial and then my last name in the field. And it's just, it's been a nightmare. So, look, if you don't have kids yet, do me a favor. <laughs> Either don't give them a middle name or make them go by their first name. That's, that will simplify matters in the data entry world that we live in today. <laughs> well, before we even look at the Sherlockian literature around this and what, what various writers have observed over the years about it, we could talk for a minute or two about the British tradition. You know, basically, in Britain, a double surname is usually inheritable, and it's, it's taken to preserve a family name that would otherwise have become extinct because there was no male descendant bearing the name connected to the inheritance of a family estate. Mm. And, you know, examples of that are things like Harding hyphen Rolls and Stopford Sackville and, and so on. Many, many of these kinds of names are written without a hyphen, which creates some confusion. <laughs> right. um, so, for example, David Lloyd George, who was prime minister, who mm. used the hyphen when he was uh, appointed to the peerage, uh, Ian Duncan Smith, another politician, Ralph Vaughan Williams, Andrew Lloyd Webber. Mm. Um, and, you know, the great translator, the early translator of Proust, uh, Scott Moncrief, not Monty, but Scott Moncrief, <laughs> C, actually, C period, K period, Scott Moncrief. I don't remember what the CK stood for. There's Neither did he. That's part of the problem. Yeah, there's a biologist, John Maynard Smith. Today we've got great actors like Kristen Scott Thomas, who's in... Um, a slow horses these days. Helena Bonham Carter, mm. uh, the and she has said that the hyphen is optional, and apparently <laughs> several of her relatives use it in their names. And she is she's one of these people, um, you know. I think that has this double-barreled name because of hereditary kinds of issues. And then mm. the the comic uh, and actor Sasha Baron Cohen, uh, you know, who has cousins. Uh, he doesn't use a hyphen between Barron and Cohn, but I think he has cousins that, that do that. And so it's, um, <laughs> now in looking, looking well, about this let's, topic. Let's not forget, there's, there's one important one that you left out, and that, of course, is Kevin Klein, um, or as he was known in A Fish Called Wanda. I'm uh, Harvey Manfred Jensen. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are, just in looking at this, looking at this online, it's really funny. You find, the, for example, the surname of the extinct family of the Dukes of Buckingham and Chandos was the quintuple-barreled Temple Nugent Bridges Chandos Grenville. <laughs> uh, uh, and there That's... are names like Hovell Thurlow Cumming Bruce and Montague Stuart Wortley McKenzie and Plunkett. Oh, Plunkett, Ernie, Erie, Drax. That's pretty good. Lane hmm. Fox, P Pitt Rivers. That's where, pretty good. Where are you finding these? Oh, in the, in the fantasy world of the internet. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, the, the one that's probably closest to home that actually fits that pattern that you were talking about is, of course, Arthur Conan Doyle. 
Yes, but it's not Arthur Conan Doyle because his full name was Arthur Ignatius Conan Doyle. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> See, there you go. Mm. Um, but Conan was a family name on his mother's side, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. I, yep, yep, yep. We have the uh, the heritage from the Arthur Conan Doyle Encyclopedia, which, by the way, is a wonderful website. Oh, uh, fabulous. Irre irreplaceable. Indeed. And his father, uh, of course, was Charles Altamont. Uh, I don't know if he was a Conan Doyle. Charles Altamont Doyle. Oh. No, I mean, the, I think... the Sherlock... The, um, well, there is one website about home about Doyle's heritage that has Charles Altamont Conan Doyle, but I don't know that mm. he was a Conan Doyle. Um, and then, of course, he had you know he was one of nine children, seven of whom survived to adulthood, and so he had uh, uh, brothers. You know, John, his brother was in. He called him Innes, but it was, his full name was John Francis Innes Hay Doyle. And um, his son, from his first marriage, uh, Arthur Allen Kingsley Doyle. Arthur mm. Allen Kingsley Doyle, rather. And uh, Adrian, his, his son Adrian, with Gene Leckie, was Adrian Malcolm Doyle. No Conan there. Mm. Mm. Oh, interesting. So we will uh, have a link to the Conan Doyle family tree if uh, folks want to make sense of this on their own time, because clearly uh, we're not making sense. We're, we're, <laughs> we're, 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 we're making things even more complex. Uh, but this is part of uh, what we wanted to talk about here with respect to the compound surnames that we come across in uh, the canon. So... There, there are a, a, a few sources uh, that we wanted to uh, look at. And, and one, of course, is Donald Redman's A Study in Sources. And Redman actually, uh, he says, Mr. Scott Eccles, or Mr. Eccles, for again, we have the problem of an unhyphenated, apparently compound surname, is an interesting one. On Holmes' own usage, the compound name must be rejected, for he does refer to Mr. Eccles. And he says there's, there's another problem with uh, another uh, a tripartite name in the uh, Sherlock Holmes stories with Arthur Cadogan West, which is, of course, uh, from the Bruce Partington plans. And, well, there's another one. There's a hyphen in between Bruce and Partington. <laughs> so was that, was that a, a set of submarine plans from Mr. Bruce and Mr. Partington, or was it from Bruce Partington, a mm. single individual? I don't think we've ever talked about that. Yeah, I like that. That's a very good question. But he says, uh, the Victorians hang on to the middle name almost as lovingly as the Russians. Uh, Michael Harrison offers a perceptive view of the process by which Holmesian names were selected. So he fails to generalize from the example. He says, and this is, this is Donald Redman now quoting Michael Harrison. He says, when Watson's casting around for a name to hide the true identity of an honest, well-meaning, somewhat pompous gentleman <laughs> who has been made to look a bit uh, of a fool and is more puzzled than resentful, he comes out with a name so like that object of a real-life well-meaning gentleman who had been made an object of ridicule that the real and the imaginary names are almost identical. And in this case, it's Scott Ellis and Scott Eccles. Uh, and... Uh, the, the, the story of Scott Ellis, which is a real individual, says uh, Harrison says Major Boroughs had beaten up his brother-in-law, Lord Howard de Walden, rather badly, as it turned out. Lord Howard de Walden, whose family name was Scott Ellis, took Boroughs to court and then lost <laughs> in court. So Scott Ellis was made a fool by his brother-in-law, and Watson plucked that out of uh, the news and made him Scott Eccles. So, uh, but Redmond says, bearing in mind the multiple structure of the name and the frequent portmantizing of more than one name and or personality in a single character, it's useful to cast back for other sources as well. So John Eccles, whose name got into the newspaper on September the 28th, 1886 in Portsmouth, which, let's not forget, that's where Conan Doyle lived, and that may have come to the attention 
of a young doctor who kept extensive and systematic notes. In Norwood, in the late 90s, lived Herbert Ansley Eccles and William Sultan Eccles, both in Church Road. And while John Scott lived in Norwood, William Scott in Upper Norwood and two Mrs. Scotts in Norwood, the multiple impressions of familiar names produced the bemused and irritated Mr. John Scott Eccles of Popham House Lee. That is, that is some detective work on Redmond's part. Well, it is. I'm surprised that, that in there, I mean, he's making a couple of very good points, one of which is, if, and Richard Lancelin Green did a great deal of this when he was, you know, and, and of course, Redmond has this history of uh, looking at sources and things, but also Richard Lancelin Green did this in the Oxford Sherlock Holmes in thinking about possible inspirations for this fact or that fact in the Sherlock Holmes stories. And so touching on the newspapers in these cases, particularly court cases and names that might have come up, or people in Portsmouth, you know, I think is really very interesting and rewarding. But I'm always surprised when we get into this, um, this particular name, John Scott Eccles, that I've never encountered any Sherlockian writer who tumbled or mentioned the Eccles cake, you know, which I remember from, um, you know, being in England. Uh, an Eccles cake is, is a, well, I don't know, it's kind of like a small scone or a small, you know, it's kind of like a small scone or a biscuit. It's very flaky and it's full of, you know, things like candied lemon or dried currants and so Like on. a turnover. Yeah, I guess so. It's not... Um, but I don't. But I never looked up the hmm. etymology of the Eccles cake and where it's it named came after from. the English town of Eccles, which is in the historic county of Lancashire. Oh, well done, well done. I had no yeah. idea. So and, it's in uh, Lancashire, eh? I wonder what, what, uh, why this came to be associated with. Now there's a story. <laughs> Let's do We're that really, next week. <laughs> <laughs> when we do cakes in the canon, let's do, yeah, the Eccles cake. Hmm, interesting. Well, they're really, they're only known as Eccles cakes when they come from the Eccles region of <laughs> Lake Champagne. <laughs> no, uh, interestingly enough, they do not have protected geographical status, so uh, they can be <laughs> manufactured anywhere and still be Eccles cakes. Oh, wow, good. Uh, see, that was a missed opportunity. They could have been like, those folks in Lancashire should have followed the French, you know, in Champagne. and uh, Exactly. Taking care <laughs> of that. Ah, <laughs> Champagne. Well, um, <laughs> let, let's take a quick snack break here, yes. and uh, we'll be back in just a moment. Well, Bert, we're talking about... Uh, lots of different source material and uh, I think the next one we're going to come up to is from the Baker Street Journal and the Baker Street Journal is just so filled with information past and present uh, obviously you can go to the Baker Street Journal website and take out a subscription and get current scholarship but there's a benefit there by taking out well not taking out but purchasing a copy of the EBSJ which is a searchable database of all of the entries in the Baker Street Journal from 1946 clear through to 2011. There's a whole host of material there. How has your experience been with searching the EBSJ for material? Oh, it's invaluable. It really is invaluable. And you have to pay attention to the search, too, because... The whole thing, you know, I think is very well packaged, and of course PDFs are very searchable, particularly large collections of PDFs. But the nice thing about the um, EBSJ is that when you're looking for a particular author or a turn or a phrase or a word, um, you will be, depending on how you organize your search, you'll be presented with the results with the most substantial, let's say, the most substantive at the top of the list, which makes your life very easy, particularly as you're going through decades of Baker Street journals. And many of these names, for example, like Cadog and West, uh, you know, have been referred to countless times, but you'll find the ones that, that get into these things in greater detail up at the top of your search list. So it's very useful. 
Indeed, and it will be useful if you want to follow the rabbit holes that we are giving you in this particular episode. So just go to BakerStreetIrregulars.com and purchase your copy of the EBSJ today. All right, I mentioned that uh, Donald Redman mentioned David Skeen Melvin. <laughs> well, there's a compound surname for you. Uh, Skeen Melvin uh, wrote an article in the June 1971 issue of the Baker Street Journal called Some Notes on the Name of the Brothers Moriarty. Well, we're not going to go into the Moriarty side, but we're going to concentrate on what Skeen Melvin told us about uh, the Bruce Partington plan. So, Bert, why don't you pick up on that? Yes, but I just had an interesting idea. Has anybody ever proposed that maybe James Moriarty was a compound surname, and that's oh, why there are more than one of them? That really, is, f- yeah. Really, the professor's name was Dave. <laughs> Dave, <laughs> Dave James Moriarty. And his brother, Horace James Moriarty, <laughs> was the station master. What? I, now, wouldn't that be interesting? That, that, you have something. This is a really neat angle. Well, maybe yeah. someone will write this up based on being in, maybe one of our seven listeners <laughs> will be glad to, uh, to, to take this and uh, run with it. Yeah, fascinating. So, um, Skein, this fellow, Skeen Melvin, Skeen Melvin, what an interesting name, writes, uh, compound names are quite common in the canon, but they're rare in the United States. And it's not surprising, because they're rare here, that Americans have not really recognized them. Um, you know, and he, sort of, Skane Melvin says rather authoritatively, well, quite obviously, John Scott Eccles, the compound name of Scott Eccles, even though he is referred to as both Mr. Scott Eccles and Mr. Eccles, you know, it is a compound name. And in the same fashion, Arthur Cadogan West, it's a compound surname. Uh, you know, and he is referred to various times as Arthur Cadogan West or Young West or mostly Cadogan West. So there you go. Yeah, and um, of of course, uh, this this gets to the split between Americans and British. Americans would assume that uh, in Cadogan West's uh, example that his surname was West with Arthur and Cadogan as his given names. Um, so he, uh, let me see, Skane Melvin says, uh, this hypothesis is proven wrong by Sherlock Holmes' own words upon announcing that he and Watson are leaving to visit the boy's parents. Now we shall turn to the Cadogan Wests, he says. <laughs> so if Arthur's second given name was Cadogan and his surname was merely West, no one would refer to his family as the Cadogan Wests. The only given name of the clerk that we are cognizant of is Arthur, and his surname is Cadogan West. So we can readily see that compound names are taken for granted in the canon and appear Mm -hmm. regularly. So if you can, uh, just off the top of your head, Bert, Mm. uh, conjure up some other compound surnames or tripartite names that we come across in the canon... We, we have John Scott Eccles. We have Arthur Cadogan West. Any others that come to mind? Uh, well, there's John Hector McFarlane. Hmm. And From uh, the Norwood Builder. Yep. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, the unhappy John Hector McFarlane. So there's four names right there. Was, <laughs> was he unhappy because he his middle name himself. was Hector? No, I think he introduces himself as unfortunate. I am the unfortunate, doesn't he? I am the unhappy John Hector unhappy. McFarlane. Yeah. See? Yeah, oh. John was. Vince, was, yeah. was was he unhappy because Hector was a middle name, or because it was part of a compound surname? Oh. That's, <laughs> well, that's. I think he was just generally depressed. <laughs> he was. <laughs> he was. He was tired of being Hectored. He was tired of being Hectored and McFarland. But there's also John Vincent Harden, and oh, and of course, yeah. you know, the big one, of course, is Charles Augustus Milverton. Hmm. Well, and that's an interesting one because I don't think we think of uh, Milverton as Augustus Milverton ever. No. No. That very clearly seems to be a middle name. Yeah. But I wonder why, in that case, we've 
we've shifted our mentality from compound surname to first, middle, last. I don't know. You know, it, the, the other thing we haven't talked about is the impression that a compound surname or these extensive names um, convey to people. You know, you can tell when you look at Conan Doyle's family and the multiple, you know, the multiple names, three or four names, uh, even down to his sons, Dennis and Adrian. Mm -hmm. um, in a way, you know, the naming reflects the enthusiasms and interests, obviously, of the parents. And Conan Doyle and his mother, Mary Foley, you know, were greatly interested in history and heritage and the early days and the kings of England. And, and so I think some of that is reflected in the choices of these names as they sort of collide together. But Conan Doyle himself, you know, Redmond says rather authoritatively um, that uh, you know, Conan Doyle was Conan Doyle. But my memory is that when Conan Doyle was knighted, um, mm -hmm. from a standpoint of, um, you know, the masters of the roles and so on, that he was uh, formally Sir Doyle, not Sir Conan Doyle. But I could be completely wrong. And that his wife was would be Lady Doyle and not Lady Conan Doyle. But, mm. you know, I'm just an American and I could be completely wrong, as I usually am. <laughs> well, uh, here again we turn to uh, Redman, who uh, says Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is an example of what can happen. His surname and that of his family was Doyle. Mm. He preferred to use a Conan Doyle mm. and is regarded as having an exclaimed, as, as having exclaimed summarily to someone, my name, sir, is Conan Doyle. Mm. His son Adrian, having the middle name Conan, uh, and that was, of course, uh, as we mentioned before, Conan was the surname of Arthur's uncle, Michael mm. Conan. Uh, referred uh, preferred to consider his name to be Conan Doyle. His mother was referred to as Lady Conan Doyle, Lady Jean Conan Doyle, or Lady Doyle. So that clears up exactly nothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think we should just simplify all of it by calling him Sir Arthur. <laughs> oh, I think that's a very... Very good idea. And these other names, you know, as they sort of fly off the page and off the desk and onto the floor, oh, only trifles. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. My father was in the Secret Service, Mr. Manfred Ginsinger, and I know perfectly well that you don't keep the general public informed when you are debriefing KGB defectors in a safe house. <laughs>